This video is brought to you by John Robson Guitar Tuition. If you enjoy the content, please consider supporting the channel by enrolling on a course, purchasing some guitar lessons or a t-shirt, or you can join my Patreon. Now, on with the show. Hello chaps, welcome once again to John Robson Guitar Tuition. As always, I do hope you're well. Now, today is another one of these videos where I blether on a bit about uh, some of my favourite musical things of one nature or another. And I've done various uh, videos like this before, where, for instance, I've talked about my favourite blues albums, or my favourite live albums, or my favourite guitar tones, or various different albums across different genres that I love and why I love them. But it struck me that the one thing I don't think I've done uh, is a list of my five favourite blues guitar players. And uh, I thought I'd set that right today. Um, basically, this list started off just off the top of my head with about 40 names on it. And I narrowed it down and narrowed it down and ended up with the five players who I just couldn't bring myself to not put on the list. And that's what we're going to run down today, starting with... Gary Moore. Yes, indeed, Gary. Um, it's no secret that, that I'm a huge fan of Gary, and uh, this was certainly one of the names that I just could not not put on the list, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah, I first got to know Gary's music in the early 80s when I went to college. Uh, someone had um, a cassette of his current album at the time, which was Victims of the Future, and uh, I was suitably impressed with it. Um, then I, uh, I ended up getting, uh, a VHS of a Irish tour that he did. I think the, uh, the, uh, video was called Emerald Isles. And there's some backstage footage in that, uh, VHS, uh, of him and Phil Lynott just jamming out a, tw a 12 bar shuffle backstage. And I thought at the time, wouldn't it be really cool if he would do an album full of this sort of stuff? And, you know, a few years later, um, he did Still Got the Blues. And that just, I mean, that blew me away, that album. That's one of the albums that I've talked about on this uh, other series of videos I do about why I love this album. And, you know, blues purists didn't quite um, like it at the time. It was too rocky and it was too shreddy and it was too, you know, the, the gain was turned up too high on the amp and stuff. But to me, you know, there are plenty of rock guitarists who've tried their hand at blues, at some successfully, some not. I mean, have you ever heard Ingve playing blues? It's the funniest thing you'll ever hear, honestly. Talk about missing the point. Um... But Gary, despite the fact that he has this big, high-gain, shreddy rock tone and he's blazing across the fretboard like a man possessed, there's still an innate bluesiness about it. His phrasing, albeit fast, it's fast blues, it's blues phrasing. You know, it's definitely got that sort of bluesy call and response question and answer thing going on in just hard-wired, hard-baked into his playing. And you couple that with the amazing, I think, guitar tone that he got on Still Got the Blues album and beyond. His blistering technique and just that innate sense of melody that is just was part of him then that is why gary is on this list again one of my top five blues guitarists hands down no questions asked next robin ford yeah now robin um again i th this was a sort of a coming together of, of two sort of uh things really when i first got into robin ford for a while i'd been thinking wouldn't it be cool if there was a guitar player who combined like a um, a kind of, you know, rock, uh, or, you know, kind of dirty, sleazy rock kind of guitar tone, but with more of the sort of harmonic sophistication of, say, someone like Django Reinhardt. Um, and then I was reading the, the guitar magazines. I think this was in 88. And suddenly they, kept, they started talking about this guy, Robin Ford, um, who was, you know, I'd never heard of to that point. I'll be honest with you. Uh, but it seemed like the, 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 the way they were talking about him, it was like he was, you know, an established name who sort of, um, you know, come back to having a, a, made a solo career comeback basically after playing with lots of other people like Miles Davis and, and so on. And the, the whole, um, flavor of the article about Robin was that it was this kind of sophisticated, harmonically complex blues. 
and you know so I immediately uh, set about getting myself a copy of the album and absolutely adored it. The album that really sold me on Robin, though, I think was one that came out in either the late 80s or the early 90s. The the first one he did um, with his trio, The the Blue Line, um, I think it's just called Robin Ford and the Blue Line. That's a fantastic album, just from the opening track, uh, The Brother and Prison of Love and step on it and start it up. loads of great songs on that album and once again it is identifiably blues that you could not really with a straight face call it jazz but he's using jazzy kind of ideas in in terms of his note choices but the phrasing is blues and it's just a fantastic blues album and as are all of his all of his blues albums i think it's um it's got that sophistication but still manages to say stay identifiably bluesy and what a guitar tone as well um that was the album talk to your daughter that introduced me to the, the idea that there was this handmade amp out there called a dumble and uh, yes i might own one one day so there we go robin ford is on the list next eric clapton Yes, now Clapton, um, he has his detractors, doesn't he? And I could almost say that I was one of them. Um, there are huge swathes of Eric's career where, you know, he's phoning it in, frankly. Um, you know, it's, he's admitted so himself, you know, in his autobiography, he says that, um, for large parts of the, uh, of the seventies and, and most of the eighties, it was just, you know, making an album and and doing a tour was just a, a party. It was just a, a way of, you know, earning money and funding his lifestyle. Um, but when he gets serious, when he gets that uh, muse inside of him, uh, you know, motivating him on a purely musical level, there are few that I think can touch him as a blues guitarist. If you're in any doubt about that, then possibly you haven't heard the Layla and other assorted love songs album. We all know the title track, um, but go and listen to it if you haven't heard it. I, I can think there's probably one slightly kind of meh track on there called Thorn Tree in the Garden, but the rest of the album is just a bluesy tour de force. Not all of the songs are straight ahead 12 bars. Um, you know, you got um, Bell Bottom Blues, for example. That's not a, a, a traditional blues at all, but it's bluesy. Um, then you've got fantastic... Um, versions of have you ever loved a woman and the um the standout track for me is the uh the extended impromptu jam uh her key to the highway the old big bill brunsey song and it's just eric and Dwayne allman trading solos just having the time of their lives you can you can smell the whiskey in the room and feel the eye contact it is an absolute tour de force and for that one album alone eric would be on this list but he's done other albums that maybe aren't up there with it, but they're certainly a big, huge cut above the average run of the mill. Uh, you know, his blues comeback album in the 90s from the cradle, again, fantastic album, really kind of authentic, gutsy, raunchy, just live blues album. I mean, like, not as in, in front of an audience, but you can tell that everybody is, you know, in the room and just you know, kind of feeling the, the, the same vibe. Uh, me and Mr. Johnson, there's another one. And that album that he did with B.B. King, Riding with the King, that's, that's a bit of a sleeper album, uh, but there's some fantastic playing on that. And you can tell you're listening to two guys who have the ultimate respect for each other and, you know, and they're playing to impress each other. And that does certainly bring out the best in, or amongst Eric's best performances, I think, as a blues guitarist. So there you go. Clapton's on the list. Next. Stevie Ray Vaughan. Well, again, another player who just, no matter how many times I cut this list down, the, the, there was never any doubt that Stevie was going to be, uh, you know, occupying a, a place on this list. I first heard about Stevie again, much like Robin Ford, through the uh, the pages of Guitar Player magazine in the 80s. And um, there was this sort, sort of talk about what a unique sound he had. Uh, and you try to kind of when you when you haven't heard it, and you try to piece together an idea of what this sound is, and you know it was like this deep twangy blues. So I had this idea that it was okay. So it's a bit like Dwayne Eddy playing blues, then is it? 
Oh boy, was I in for a shock, you know. I did that thing that we used to do back then. You read about an album, you think, yeah, there's a fair strong chance I'm going to enjoy that album. And you just go out and buy it, and you've never heard a note of music before. So that's what I did with Texas Flood. And wow, you know, I mean, yes, it's a unique sound. It's no one else sounded like Stevie, or does sound like Stevie, or had sounded like him before. You can hear other players' influences in there. You can definitely hear a lot of Albert King and, you know, a fair bit of Hendrix, but you would never put a Stevie Ray Vaughan album on and think, oh, is that Albert King? Oh, no, it's Stevie. Or a Hendrix album thing. Is that... Even when... um Stevie did his version of Little Wing. It's identifiably Stevie Ray Vaughan's version of it rather than being, you know, somebody copying the Hendrix version. It's a fantastic album. Uh, that was from the, um, what was the album? Uh, the Sky is Crying, the posthumous release. But every single Stevie Ray Vaughan album, it's, you know, I can't think that there was, you know, a weak album in his catalogue. Possibly the live album. Possibly the Live Alive album, because that was, you know, at the height of his, um, shall we say, personal uh, issues that he was having with uh, various substances. And it, it it did lack a little bit of something, I thought. And it was, you know, retouched a bit in the studio. But everybody's allowed one slightly below par album. But even that is a cut above what most, art, most artists would come out with. Um, his entire career, you know, it's he's just an inspirational player for me. He, he picks up, or he picked up a guitar, and the music just seemed to gush out of him in an effortless manner. With that, and you know, it didn't seem to matter what guitar he was playing, uh, what he was plugged into he still sounded like Stevie Ray Vaughan and the music was just flowing out of him in an, in a completely musical and effortless manner so that's why he's on the list next Josh Smith yes now um this is a relatively recent discovery for me and I'm at that sort of point in the process where um I'm just going back and uh, discovering the catalog you know and discovering the albums and immersing myself in in a particular album and learning to appreciate it and you know getting an appreciation of each particular album in turn and uh, i first discovered uh, josh through um, i guess what is the modern equivalent of you know discovering somebody through a guitar hand, uh, guitar magazine rather um he um he cropped up on YouTube and he seemed like a really nice likable chap and he was demoing some licks and explaining about uh you know how he plays over this type of chord change or that type of chord change and it was he was just seemed like a, such a, a a nice guy and um very personable and you know demoed a few tasty licks and then another video crops because you watch that one video of, of Josh Smith another one crops up in your suggestions and I you know got into a bit of a role and thought I should check this guy's albums out and dearie me what a player what an absolute stellar player if you imagine again that the sort of harmonic sophistication and um complexity of Robin Ford crossed with the sort of country chicken picking uh, shenanigans that you would expect from Danny Gatton and mix that with a bit of good old raw cranked up Fender Texas blues tone that you would get from Stevie and put those all into a melting pot you have something that sounds very much like Josh Smith I'm currently uh, absolutely loving I think this is his latest studio release Burn to Grow and uh, the live album uh, Live at the Spud F fantastic pair of albums you know just what a player just you know he deserves a place on any uh, list like this that I'm doing of my five favourite blues guitarists so there you have it folks let me know in the comments I'm sure you will you usually do uh, what you think about this category you know if you're not into blues then you probably won't be bothered uh, but if you're a blues fan let me know who your five favourite blues guitarists are and you know a couple of lines about why that's the case if you feel so inclined and uh, that is pretty much all we're going to talk about for today folks thank you so much for watching i uh, hope you enjoyed the video if you have then please hit the subscribe button and the notification bell if you haven't already done so and why not give me a like while you're at it but for now i'll bid you all a good day and say thank you for watching thank you for your time look after yourselves folks stay well stay safe and above all stay sane bye for now <laughs>